everyone. In this video, I'm going to go through a practice problem, which is all about price floors. So I'm going to be working with this diagram here. So I won't be working with any algebraic functions here, but I will do another practice question on price floors where I do work with functions. And when that's done, I'll link it up here and also in the description below. All right, let's start with thinking about part A. The diagram below shows a market in equilibrium. And just in case it's not obvious, the equilibrium price is 40 and the equilibrium quantity is 80. That's marked P star and Q star. In part A, we are asked a price floor of $60 is imposed on this market. Draw the price floor on the diagram. Is it a binding or non-binding floor? Is there a glut or a shortage? And how much is the glut or the shortage? Now, with questions where you're given a diagram like this, we have to first figure out if and how we can get meaningful numbers from this diagram. And on this diagram, I can actually see that each square must be equal to 10. So I can see that, for instance, if I look at the price axis intercept of the supply function, it's 20, and that corresponds to kind of two squares up. You can confirm that with the equilibrium price of 40, that's four squares up. And the equilibrium quantity is eight squares across if you count. And so we can see here that each square uh, is equal to 10. And that basically means that if I count six squares up, that's going to give me that price level associated with 60. The price floor can be represented as a line across like this. So that's the first part of the question. We have drawn the price floor on our diagram. We then have to decide whether this price floor is binding or not. Now, in general, a binding price floor is one that makes a difference to the market. It binds it to an outcome it would not otherwise reach. A non-binding price floor, on the other hand, makes no difference to the market outcome. It does not bind a market to a particular outcome. And if, if that's the case, the market will just revert to the equilibrium. Now, a price floor prevents the price from going below some level. So our price floor in this question will prevent the price from going below 60. Now, in general, price floors that lie above the equilibrium price will be binding. So I can see here automatically our price floor is above our equilibrium price, so it's binding. And just to explain why, when the price is 60, we kind of have the following dynamics between demand and supply. Seeing where our price line of 60 hits our demand, we can see how much is demanded at that price, drawing a line down. We can see, and again, I'm just going to count the number of squares. There are four squares in total from the origin to this point, so that's a quantity of 40. The quantity demanded at the price of 60 is then 40. We can do the same thing with our supply. So we see where the price line of 60 hits our supply curve. We draw a line down from that point and we see the quantity supplied at the price of 60 is 160. And actually we can see then that the amount supplied, that's 160 at that price of 60, is greater than the amount which is demanded, which is just 40. So we have an excess supply or a glut in this market because of the price floor. And we can find out by how much, we just take the difference between 160 and 40, so it's of an amount of 120. So the glut is equal to 120. So at the price floor, the market experiences a glut. There is too much stock and the price is too high. Now, if the price floor wasn't there, the mechanism by which our suppliers and our market players would get rid of this stock is through a lowering of the prices. So the suppliers would say there was just too much stock on their shelves. They would notice this and they would want to get rid of that stock. And in order to do that, they lower the price. As they lower the price, we're going to get movement along both curves towards the equilibrium. So at the lower prices, as the price decreases, our quantity supplied will decrease. That's a leftward movement along the supply curve. And our quantity demanded will increase. That's a movement along the demand curve to the right. So as the price decreases, then the glut, the difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right up until we get to the equilibrium where quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. At this point, there's no more glut and there's no reason for our suppliers to change the price because they don't need to. They have no more excess stock to get rid of. 
When there is a price floor, however, the price of $60 is the lowest price that the market can get to. It's prohibited from going below 60. So there's a law or a decree and it just prohibits the price from going below 60. So the market is bound to that higher price, which is not the equilibrium price and it can't get to the equilibrium. So that's why it's a binding price floor. Now, if the price floor was below our equilibrium price of 40, say it was $30, it would be non-binding because the price would never try to get below $30 and we would end up just at the equilibrium price of 40. All right, I think we've done all of part A then. We figured that we have a binding price floor that will lead to a glut of 120. Let's go on to part B then. We are asked to calculate consumer surplus, producer surplus and deadweight loss. And we need to shade these areas in the diagram. Let's start with consumer surplus. Consumer surplus will be the area below the demand curve above the price over the units traded. Now in this market, the price is $60 and 40 units will be traded. As we saw in part A at this price, the quantity supplied is 160, but we just don't have the demand for this amount. Our consumers will only buy 40. So that's how much is actually traded. And that means the area of our consumer surplus will be here, the green area. Consumer surplus is just CS. And the formula for the area of the triangle is half times base B times height H. The base is going to be four squares, so 40. The height is equal to this length here, 80 minus 60, so 20. Half times 40 is 20. So we get 20 times 20, which is 400. So that's consumer surplus. Our producer surplus will be actually equal to this red area here, the area above our supply curve under the price over all the units traded. Now here you might have questions. Producer surplus is the difference between the price and the willingness to sell over all units traded. And one interpretation of our supply curve is as tracking our willingness to sell, which is WTS. Now our WTS is like the reservation price. It's the minimum price that a supplier needs to be incentivized to supply a particular marginal unit. So when the price is greater than that, then that's good for the producer and the difference is surplus. And that's why we take the area underneath the price above our supply curve. By taking this area in red, however, we are assuming that it is the first 40 units that are actually being traded. But we know that there is a glut in this market. There's actually a full 160 that are being supplied. And the WTS for all these 160 units, well, they're all below the price, but they're all very different. You can see it's upward sloping. And who knows actually which ones are being traded, which of those 160 units get to be traded in this market. If any of the units on the upper part of the supply curve were being traded instead of the first 40, our producer surplus would look different because the willingness to sell would be different. So we do have to make this assumption that it's the first 40 that are being traded. And that's why it's the red area that's our producer surplus. It is a fine point. No one really talks about it. So I hope I don't confuse you. But if you had that worry going into this content, I hope that making that assumption really explicit clears it up for you. Now, the area of our producer surplus, it's PS, is a trapezium. And I always forget the formula for the area of a trapezium. So I always just divide this area into a rectangle plus a triangle, which is this area here. Now the area of the rectangle is base times height. So the base is this length here, which we said was 40 and the height is three blocks. So that's 30. And we add to that the area of the triangle, which is half times the base of the triangle, which is four blocks. So 40 times the height, which is 10. 30 times 40 is equal to 1,200 and half times 40 is 20, uh, 20 times 10 is 200. So 1,400 all up for our producer surplus. The next is deadweight loss, which is equal to this triangle here in deadweight loss. I'll just notate DWL. Again, the area is half times base times height. So half times we can make this line the base, so three squares, so 30 times the height, which would be this length. That's four squares, so 40. So half times 30 times 40, which is 600. And that's part B. In part C, we are asked, does any side of the market, consumer or producer, benefit from the imposition of the price floor explain? Now, intuitively, the price floor has raised the price. So if it's going to be anyone, we would definitely think it would be the producer who benefits from this. To do this properly, however, we really should compare the distribution 
or so just the amounts of the surplus before and after the imposition of the price floor. So we've done after the imposition of the price floor. Let me clear my screen. Right, I've put my findings down here about our welfare with the price floor. And I'm going to add to this here our total surplus calculations just because it will be useful. That's actually equal to consumer surplus plus producer surplus. So 1,400 plus 400, so 1,800. I have also included a note up here in pink describing the strategy for part C. We're going to compare the surplus before and after the price floor to see who is affected and who benefits from this price floor, if anyone. Now, in the absence of the price floor, the price is equal to just 40, that's P star, and the quantity traded is 80, that's Q star. Our consumer surplus will be this area here, the area below the demand curve above the price over the units traded. So we're just going to use our very familiar uh, area of a triangle, half times base times height. The base will be 80, and the height is 80 minus 40, so 40. Half times 80 times 40 is 1,600. Producer surplus is this area here, the area above our supply curve below the price across all units traded. Again, half times base times height, base will be 80. Height is 40 minus 20, so 20. And this is all equal to 800. And you can see quite clearly, if we compare the surplus amounts that we've calculated before, you can see our producer surplus increases by a, a large amount. We go from 800 to 1,400. Consumer surplus has actually decreased. In the absence of the floor, it is 1,600. With the floor, it decreases to 400. So the producers are benefiting and the consumers are not. And that's really the question then. At this point, we can, I'll just show you one last thing, just check our calculations. So our dead weight loss, which we found in part B, we saw that it was equal to 600. Well, one interpretation of this deadweight loss is it's the loss of surplus as we move away from the perfectly competitive equilibrium. So we can check that that's true. So we're going to check the difference between our total surplus. Now the total surplus in the case of no price floor is just consumer plus producer surplus. So 1,600 plus 800, 2,400. Total surplus with the price floor we saw before was 1,800. The difference is 600. So we have confirmed our workings because that's the same amount of our deadweight loss. That all makes sense. Before I finish, let me just write out the answer to part C. Producer surplus increases from 800 to 1,400 as a result of the price floor. So producers benefit. And that's it for this question. I really hope that the video helped. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe um, and have a good one, everyone.